I guess we can start. Yeah. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Um, Miha, would you like to kind of share your screen? Just to begin with. So thank you very much for joining from wherever in the world you are, with folks from Amsterdam, London, Wellington, if I'm not mistaken, obviously Sydney, Melbourne, um, few other places. I think we had people from um, North America as well joining. Um, so welcome to this uh, meetup for Systems as Play community. It's a community of systems thinker, thinkers, obviously. And uh, I just wanted to welcome you on behalf of um, Systems at Play. Um, today we have a obviously session on applied system thinking for organization and exploration of that with John, and uh, which I'll introduce um, soon. And uh, if we move to the next slide, Mial. So my name is Ali Dal Hamidi. I'm one of the co-founders of the Systems at Play community. Um, and uh, we're really happy to be here with you. Uh, I'll just quickly hand over to Dave and Michal to introduce themselves, and then I'll talk a little bit about systems at play, and then um, we move on to the topic at hand today. So, um, hi, yeah, sure. I'm I'm Dave. Hi, guys. Um, that's me on the left there, not on the right in the picture. Um, <laughs> Your left or my left? <laughs> oh, I don't don't confuse me like that. <laughs> Um, yeah, basically similar to Ali, though, we won't introduce ourselves much. We're just here to hopefully create this community and uh, help us start founding it in Sydney and around the world. Yeah, guys, I'm Mihail, pretty much working with Ali, Dad and Dave. Ooh, it's been uh, over a year now that we've been uh, kind of trying to cook up this community and uh, yeah, glad that uh, you have joined us as well. Thank you all. Thank you. And obviously, um, the key point is is you as well. Um, so this community is obviously nothing without you participating. So uh, we founded it and we kind of established a container for us to um, to get together. But um, I guess I guess this is about you um, as 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 well as us. So um, maybe on that note, um, um, I know that more people will be joining soon. Well, we got to go through uh, a kind of a big, big agenda now. So if I get everyone to just, if you can, if you like, just turn on your camera. So we'll just take a group picture with the, with the community and then we can move on to our presentation. And I think I, think I will have to take two pictures because, okay, just give me a minute. Done. And one more time let me just save that one so i don't lose it one and then i will do another one quickly and then we can start um by the way we are um recording this session so um we will edit uh, some part of it but uh just just to let you know that the session is being recorded so obviously it will be access accessible later we would definitely do some editing but i just wanted to let you know um so can we move on to the next slide Michal? so just a little bit about the story of systems at play um really uh the idea of the community was born out of a few inspiration. One of them was we we're all into I uh, myself, Dave and Michal, we've been working on it for a while now, and we're all into change and 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 looking at um systemic ways of doing things and acting in the world. But we kind of got a bit frustrated in the kind of dominant reductionist way of thinking and uh, its um impact on failure of the institutions, whether it's at, at in community, government corporations or globally. Uh, and then we also realized when we started early days on the um, system thinking journey, our, our understanding of system thinking was very limited. But once we started to realize and interact with few system thinkers, we, um, we actually um, realized that system thinking is such a vast and deep ocean that we just, what we know is probably just a drop of it. So as a result of that, we kind of turned that into a kind of a passion 
and um, aspiration to kind of create an environment that we can learn together given the challenge ahead. And we wanted to make sure we have an impact as well. So system thinking for us is not just about work. It's, it's having that awareness that in our personal life, in our organization, in our community um, as well. Um, so as I said, because it's such a vast um, topic and an and, and area of, of thinking and acting, um, the best way we thought the best way to understanding is through obviously starting with the humility of what we don't know. Um, so like I said, there's a lot to learn. And then um, through exploration of multiple perspectives, you know, and, and, and that's not possible without obviously having a sense of curiosity. And we would like to, we would hope that um, this community that we, we just we just founded and um, we have our first session with you folks is um, also have a little bit of a playfulness. And, and obviously we hope that we can create conditions that we can have lots of collective learning and reflection and, and feedback. Um, so uh, we can move on to the next one. Uh, what we have been busy with, Michal mentioned that we started probably about a year ago with Michal and Dave, and um, we started to connect to um, many folks that have been in systems thinking or shown interest. And so far we've done, um, before we established the meetup, we've done a um, few workshops. We've done a system thinking workshop in um, uh, Lean Agile and System Thinking Conference. We've organized two for two international uh, system practitioners to present at a, a different community meetup. We've so far conducted two community survey on system thinking. This meetup as well is a result of the feedback we received from those that a lot of folks wanted to know more about application of system thinking that this is where we started to connect to John and other practitioners. Um, we are, we've organized for the first trial of the viable system model training in December. Because it's it's a trial version, we have very small group um, that is attending for now uh, through our UK practitioners. But if it, if it turn out good, um, we are going to scale that and, and start opening up for the rest of the community. And uh, we also conducted an, an author's view, view article in the system thinking. Um, I'll try to move through the next two slides quickly. Um, so what is our intention? Uh, really, we, we want more than anything, we want to create a condition for a, a kind of a fluid space. What do I mean by that? It, it's not about myself or Michal or, or Dave, it's about us just creating the container for you folks to also self-organize and interact and, and work together. Um, sharing your insights, your experience, your questions. Um, and, and I think for us, it's not just an intellectual pursuit. It's we want to have an impact through the community. So um, we do value theory as well as practice. One without the other, we believe, um, doesn't necessarily work well. And um, the way we are thinking about the community at the moment, obviously we have the meetup, which you joined. Uh, we have organized a Slack channel. We will send the link. We've already put a link on the meetup, but we will also send the link at the end of the session. Um, the, the Slack channel is good for you folks to join and continue the learning, connect to each other, help each other out, and um, also sharing. Um, we, we realize that finding and filtering information is quite difficult given there's vast amount of information, system thinking and internet, sometimes a lot of misinformation. And, uh, and obviously we wanted to have this fluid space um, to actually share, you know, share the good articles you find if there is a good conference or seminar or meetup that you're aware of, if you know good folks that you can, they can present. If you yourself want to present, you would like to come forward and um, and and talk to us, um, talk to us about that, and um, and hopefully through that we will achieve our intention of having an impact and expanding the system thinking. A key aspect of that as well is um, multiple perspective and collective learning. I think it's quite important for us to create the conditions for 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 that. So. Um, 
I guess there's a lot to talk about, and I'm really glad to see everyone here. Thank you for joining. Um, I, I can see that some folks are joining really, really early time. Some of you just about just you just finish your work, and um, and and you're spending this time with us. We're really happy to have you here. And I hand over to Dave. Not a problem. So what we thought we'd do is uh, try to get a little bit of information from you to start with. Uh, on the screen, you'll see a QR code. If you want to hold up your phone or enter in that, um, that uh, URL into a browser and type in the event number of 4242. What you should see is um, a question come up, um, which um, Mikhail will now, will now show you what that experience will be like. Any second now. Yeah, just give give folks a, a minute to scan and see the Slido. So it's going to be two questions, and we'll ask one question first, and then we will go to the next one. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Dave. Uh, just apologies. Is William here? I'm on the road, so I probably won't be able to do that kind of interaction to that fine. much. That's fine. Sorry. Okay. Hey, Hal, if you can bring up that um, on the screen. So if everyone has um, already responded, we can move on to the next. Oh, I think it's still, still coming through. Cool. So we're around 20. So hopefully we get a few more and then we can move on to the next question quickly. Cool. Mihal, would you would you be able to share your screen? Cool. Wonderful. Okay. All right. So well, the first question was around what your role, uh, what's your current role or title? So you can see a few things. It's good. We've got a few different things in there. Good to see a CEO in the group. Uh, we've got a, quite a few coaches and quite a few people who um, associate as consultants in the group and a few individual ones as, as well. So it's an interesting group. Well, we use this to actually get an idea about what's in the community and who's interested in these sorts of things so that we can actually think about who it is that's in, in the group and tailor things towards that. But it's just good to see that. This information we'll probably uh, also share. So here is the next one. Okay. Next question. Next question is about experience. And it's about your experience with application of systems thinking. With five being the highest. Here is here are pictures of uh, Mikhail's desktop. <laughs> okay, so the experience in the group are uh, quite a few people identifying as as, uh, as um, middle to low experience or in the mid range. No, not too many of us brave enough to say we're we're in the expert range yet. That's that's cool. Um, so it's good to see what people's experiences and what where they sort of, sort of rank themselves in that space. Cool. Okay. All right. Thanks for that, everyone. We'll um, probably um, share that information, keep that as part of it. Um, Mikhail, we'll go back to the, the main slides. Okay, and on to the next one. So here we go. Joan's hopefully getting ready now. I'm sure there's butterflies in her stomach, although I, I don't know if, if Joan gets butterflies. Um, so Joan, uh, we've chosen Joan to talk at our first meetup because she's she's pretty much amazing. Uh, she's been working in this area uh, for 25 years, not just thinking about it, but working in this area. Okay, she's uh, also over this time she's evolved the ergonomics trademark systems framework and methodology through experimentation and practice. Um, this offers uh, a scaffold for leaders and organisations to begin to navigate adaptive challenges. She also has not stopping at one, but two master's degrees, uh, one in adult education and one in development psychology. 
She is the founder of Organomics. She is passionate about assisting leaders and organizations to continuously transform themselves and function at their growing edge. She is a delightful person to talk to and an amazing teacher and mentor as well. So I'll, I'll, just before we actually cross over the journey, there's a few uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, the presentation is being recorded, we've talked about. Please stay on mute if you're not uh, presenting, which is just Joan. Uh, at the end, there'll be time for Q&A. Uh, during the presentation, please post questions into the chat field and Mikhail will um, uh, concierge those. Um, we'll just ask questions as many as we can in the Q&A. And if we can't, we'll pass them on to, to Joan and if she has time, she might find time to answer them at her leisure. Any questions before we begin? No, great. So it gives me great pleasure to hand it over to Joan. Thank you so much, Dave, and for that lovely introduction. And um, uh, yeah, it's very exciting that you're starting this community, Systems at Play. I think definitely Systems is um, growing and I couldn't be more delighted about that. And I think the more we can come together in community to explore what that means to explore its practice um, for me, particularly in organizations and how we use organizations as containers um, or incubators for systemic meaning making is a very, very critical um, thing for us all to be working on. I think, you know, how do we grow systems thinking both individually and systemically? Um, and that's a question that I've been playing with for you know decades now and I think one of the key places or contexts where we can do that is in organizations I think you know Fritjof Capra speaks about that all our world's problems are in some way connected and as a physicist one of the things he talks about is that in order for us to solve those in some ways it's quite simple and the simple resolution is that we try and help our leaders who are not yet systemic in their meaning making, either political leaders or business leaders, organizational leaders, to grow this meaning making, this sense making. And um, he, you know, I, I couldn't agree more with that starting hypothesis. So how do we come together to grow the sense making and how do we use organizations um, to do that, I think is a very compelling challenge for all of us to think about. The other thing that I'm particularly interested in and have been working with for many years is the idea of how do we bring about change in organizations. So these two ideas go hand in hand. One is how do you change organizational systems and then how do you use them as containers or incubators for growing systemic thinking. And I think that in my experience of being a change agent and doing systemic change work in organizations since the early 90s, what I've come to realize is that those are two symbiotic questions. So that in order to bring about organizational change, systemic change in organizations, we want to grow this lens. And in order to grow the lens, we can actually use systemic change in organizations as context for, for that. And uh, I was first given this um, pair of glasses in 1993, I was working in a company in South Africa. Um, we had been doing deep culture change, preparing the organization for post apartheid South Africa, um, trying to reset the dynamic between white managers and, and black workers. And literally it was that stark um, and reset the patterns of relation between management and workers, between unions and management and the CEO of that company had realized that his role um, was not only to provide shareholder returns, but also to play a critical role in um, helping to prepare his company for a post apartheid South Africa to not tolerate racism inside the company, but also to take up a role and use his position as a business leader to bring about more widespread transformation in the community and, and politically, which he chose to do. Whilst we were doing that work, he also realized that there were three businesses um, that were inside his company and a holding company, so four kind of entities that had been performing really well, but were starting to compete. 
And so he realized that he actually also needed to change the operating model of the company. So we've got these two lenses, change the culture and change the operating model. And his need was to conduct a merger actually of those four entities and create one system, one organizational entity. And one of the things he realized was to do that, he, um, he couldn't do that alone because whilst leaders were saying, yes, we needed to do that. And on some rational level, they realized they needed to do that. On another level, they um, had a lot to give up in terms of the roles that they were playing in those current organizations. And so he reached out to um, Irving Borwick, who was a leading systems thinker at the time and had begun um, exploring how you could use systems thinking um, to bring about second order change in organizations. In other words, not first order change where you were putting technical solutions into a system in order to address the challenges, but rather to completely rewire how the system was working and you know, restructure actually, not organization, but restructure the system and how all the parts were interacting, where people were drawing the boundaries and how individual roles were uh, interrelating in order to create a different pattern. And so he invited Irving Borwick to work with us. And a lot of our change work until then was really looking at behaviors, values, collective um, value systems and contextually um, giving people different experiences and using story and narrative to shift the system. And we had been very successful with that. Um, and so I'd like to say that this lens on systems thinking is not a um, alternative to um, values, behaviors, psychological work, or even technical work, but it's an additional lens that we need to bring in to what is dominant constructs in how we understand organizational change. And certainly, you know, what I got um, in meeting Irving in 1993 was this new pair of glasses, this new way of seeing, which I could add to my perspectives or add to the lenses through which I made sense of the world and through which I made sense of organizations. And getting that pair of glasses was incredibly liberating for me because it helped me understand and see stuff that I hadn't seen before. It literally opened up a whole new world for me, which had been right in front of me, but I wasn't seeing because I was framing the world and what was going on in the organization um, through either a technical or an interpersonal lens. And this third lens, a systemic lens, which is um, quite different from those two lenses, opens up a completely new possibility for how we understand organizations and for how we see them. Um, I think that what is well understood um, now and is you know, talked about um, a lot is how for this complexity of the context that we face and the rapid disruption and, uh, that we're in, there's a kind of growing knowing and acceptance that systems thinking is what's required. Uh, I don't think that there's any doubt that, you know, we need to move from lineal causal reductionist thinking from um, thinking in ways that are less binary and move towards, you know, living with uncertainty, moving into the end, all of these things, I think there's a kind of growing acceptance, and we can kind of just say those things with ease, right? Um, that we need to let go of mechanistic reductionist thinking, we need to be more systemic, um, we need to be less linear, etc. I think the challenge for us is, what does that mean in the context of organizations? And how do we grow this um, sense making and systemic intelligence in organizations, on the one hand, so how do you help people move from reductionist and mechanistic ways of understanding and knowing into systemic and more complex understanding and knowing? How, how do you do that developmental shift? What do you need to do? What do the interventions look like? And the second set of questions is, um, what are the applications for how you do systemic change in organizations? How do you bring about second order systemic change as opposed to first order technical change in organizations. And those two questions 
I think we have got an enormous amount of growing into, an enormous amount of learning to do, and um, an in, I think an imperative to accelerate. And so um, how do we start to discover what we already have in terms of these applications? And how do we experiment and learn and grow into growing this field? Because I think that while systems thinking has been around for a long time, um, you know, the 50s and the 60s, and, you know, even statements from, um, you know, philosophers in the early 1900s that you've got to understand facts in the context of the whole, etc. These kind of statements have been around for a long time. And I think systems thinking has made a lot of inroads in other contexts, ecology, families, but in organizational systems, we are green and we are just beginning. And, you know, one of the questions we could explore together is, how is it that it's coming to organizations so late? How is it that this has been in our field of knowing for decades? Um, and yet we have not developed deep expertise or methodology or applications which <coughs> the organizational context which we can really apply. Um, and I, you know, there are a few uh, theories about that. I think that for me, one of the key um, things about why we haven't moved as fast as we should have in organizations, and I think it was Russell Ackoff that said it takes about 100 years to shift a paradigm, and I think we are in a paradigm shift. So, you know, maybe we're three quarters of the way in and it's we're accelerating. But I think one of the my understanding or explanations that I would give for why we haven't made the kind of inroads is um, that how we understand organizations and how we've defined them, that assumption is probably one of the first reframes that we need to bring about. Um, I think that if I look at, and even recently I went and had a look at how are organizations defined in the dictionary or in Wikipedia, and what was really interesting for me, there was, there was a consistent idea that organizations are collections of people with a common purpose. And that description is very revealing because there is another way to understand organizations, which is not that they are collections of people with a common purpose or a common goal, but that they are complex adaptive systems where, and this is the definition that I think we need to somewhat move to if we're gonna have a breakthrough, is that actually systems are, uh, organizations are systems of interrelated roles, relations and rules of engagement. And that in fact, there is a distinction between the human systems, the collections of people that are inside organizations and the social dynamics, and then the relational dynamics in terms of the roles that people get to see they have and they occupy in relation to each other, not in relationship to each other, Can, which is the I, I, more I human just, dimension. I just need to ask, are you um, are showing slides because there's nothing showing at the moment or are you? Uh, Oh, okay, good. <laughs> we were just concerned. <laughs> Thank you. Here we are, depending uh, on our slides. I um, I thought not to use slides, even though I have some, because you know, in in a very short time with such a huge, vast, rich conversation, I thought it might be easier to talk rather than share slides more formally. Um, but I think we can make some of this available to people. So. Um, so I think that we have to reframe and redefine what we mean by organization. And I think that's one of the key things that what Irving introduced to me in 1993 was a new sense making or even meaning making for what an organization is and that it is a, a complex set of, inter, of roles, interrelational role in interrelationship um, with kind of contracted rules of engagement. And once you start to see organizations through that lens, um, I think that it changes everything, actually. Um, because you're not only bringing a psychological lens to organizations in terms of understanding behavior in them, 
which is the dominant paradigm in addition to the technical one, um, which is that what drives behavior in organizations is who we are, our values, our personality, and our relationships of trust or the dynamics between people. I think that is one lens. I think it's completely valid. But actually, what I have underpinning the ergonomics methodology is this idea that a system is a set of relations with a boundary where people are in the system in role. And you are never in a system outside of role. You're not just operating as Joan, the person, but in every system that you step into um, or that you're a part of, whether that's a system of two um, or a system of four or five, a family system or a team, or if it's a system of thousands, an organization, you are always in that system in role. And, you know, if you think about it, if we use the definition of a system to be any set of relations with a boundary, and we understand that systems are made up of individual parts, and that every part is always in the system in role, then that sense making viewing organizations through that lens allows us to understand behavior in very different ways. How does that work? because we can actually start to hold a set of assumptions that every individual in the organization carries a mental map or a construct of their role in that system and how it should work. And after doing this work for 25 years, if I ask somebody in a system, can you describe to me your mental map of the system and how you see your role in it. Can you draw that for me? Consistently, they will be able to draw that. And the reframe here is that that's like our internal GPS, that every time we join a system, an organizational system, a team, a project, what will happen is we will form a construct, a mental map of that system where we fit in it, where we belong and our role in it and how our role connects and relates to other roles. That map is implicit to us. In the main, most people don't know that they carry that map. We wear it like a filter. We navigate organizations and systems through that filter. We subject to it, it's implicit to us. But if you invite people to peel that filter back to share their construct, their meaning making, and put it out in front of them as object, you can do that. And the minute you are able to peel it back, to put it out in front of you as object, to stand back and see it from the balcony position, that is enormously liberating. Because that map and how you view the world and your role in it is defining your behavior in organizations as much as who you are the person. And if you think about it, the, the role that you occupy in systems in context, that uh, and how that role connects to other roles, the pattern of relating between actually defines our behavior, but we don't yet know it. And it's a very powerful and liberating idea for us to introduce to leaders both because it is an easy accessible way into building systems thinking and a systems lens. It's a developmental construct because actually if we think about adult development as a subject object move and helping people be less subject to their own thinking and more hold their thinking as object, this is a systems frame for make, helping people make the subject object move. And the third thing is that actually if you can reframe a, map, a mental map or shift a role in a system, you can bring about change very rapidly with a lot less turbulence and a lot less e a lot more ease um, and with a lot more speed actually than trying to change the person. If any of you have been in therapy and you know had any kind of personality profiling and assessments, you'll know that we hold on to our identities, we hold on to our values, we hold on to who we are, our styles, and what is dear and sacred to us with much more relish and strength than we do 
hold on to a mental map or a role. In fact, this is something that we're quite fluid at and we actually have a lot of agility for because I am in my role of partner, if we think about it, in my system of marriage, in that system, I'm in a role of partner, I'm in a relational pattern with my husband, we have got into our own pattern of relating, I shan't describe that here today, but um, when I take step out of that system, and the boundary of that context, and I step into role of mother, in my home, even within the boundary of the context of the home, and I step into the role of this system with my two sons, my behavior changes. Why? Because the role defines it and that system of relation defines it. And so I fluidly navigate that actually without even conscious awareness, but I would never behave in the role of mother as I would in the role of, of partner. The, if I get in my car and get into um, the system of driving on the roads of Australia, I will behave in a particular way as a driver. And by the way, I will drive very differently and take up that role in an Australian context as I would in a Vietnamese context or even in a South African context, because there are different rules of engagement and different patterning which is required of me to take up in that role in that context. And those relational patterns, those contextual cues are going to define how I take up my role in those systems as much as who I am as a person and the individual. And we have an industry of applications, looking at people, looking at leaders, trying to make sense of what are the traits of best leaders? What are the styles we need to look for? And you know, what's best practice in leadership? And that's reductionist because what that says is we are looking at leadership or change by trying to change the person or the part or optimize the part. We need a new lens that says actually leadership is about the role in relation to other. It is a shared construct. It is a relational construct. And what is required of leaders in one context, in one system might be something very different in another. And instead of looking at optimizing the part and what the part is made of, or trying to change the part if we're trying to bring about change in organizational systems, what we need to learn to see is the role relations that are between the parts and between roles, the hidden contracts, the implicit patterning that is running in those systems. And if we can help leaders and organizations and systems, teams, et cetera, make that visible, learn not to see the individual, not learn not to only see behavior, but to see pattern and to see relationship between role in system in context, then we can help leaders understand how to bring about change in completely different ways. And I've been playing with that construct for 25 years and I've been helping leaders bring about change systemic change in their organizations quite rapidly with huge performance uplift and cultural shift with, um, with a lot more ease. And they can grasp this concept because it's a way in, it makes behavior and change accessible um, to, and systems thinking actually accessible to them. I want to add one more point about it, which I think is very important, and then maybe we'll open up for questions for the last few minutes. That when we talk about role in system, I don't only think we're talking about individual roles. If we start to see organizations as complex networks of subsystems, cells, holons in holons, then what we'll understand is that those subsystems all have a role too. And in fact, what starts to happen is if you define the boundary of belonging inside a part of the system, whether it's HR or finance or an executive team or um, a project, and you see yourself belonging to that system with a role in it, what tends to happen is that everybody inside the boundary of that subsystem form collective meaning making and assumptions about their role, 
of the subsystem and how that subsystem connects and relates to other subsystems. So there's another layering here, which is extremely liberating if you can uncover the relational patterns, not only between two individual roles, but between two subsystems within the organizational context. And an example of that would be say, um, you know, today I was working with um, a CEO and an executive team who were struggling to get their strategy implemented and accepted in the organization. And they had a whole and a lot of sort of analytical explanations for why they couldn't do that. We didn't have the process. You know, we weren't, their people weren't capable. All the meaning making, which was technical or psychological, there's no buy-in. But what I invited them into was to look at their role in the system, how they were taking it up as an executive team and what they discovered very rapidly because it was just below the surface. Um, it's not deep unconscious stuff. It's assumptive meaning making that you can access. What they discovered was one of the key patterns and problems was their relational pattern with the board. And in fact, what was getting in their way was how the board saw their role, the role of the board, how the board saw the role of the executive team and how they had got patterned to relate to each other. And discovering that pattern moved them out of their attribution that the problem was technical, a process, that the problem was about people not having capability or emotionally not being resistant and not on the bus. They got a different lens, a different meaning making, a completely different sense making around what was going on in the system and the role they were playing, which was keeping the system stuck. And the liberating thing about that is, once you see, you can't unsee. If you can see that pattern, then you are able to shift your role in the system and then you can change the system. Because in a system, everything's connected. So if you are able to change your role in relation to another subsystem or role in the, in the ecosystem, you can very rapidly bring about change. We have a dominant logic in organizations that if you wanna bring about change, you've got to see the behavior. What are people doing wrong? Give them feedback in some linear way, like tell them what they should stop, start and continue. And if you give them the feedback in some linear way, that will bring about the change wrong assumption. But we've got years and years of training on how to give feedback, etc. Yes, that has a role to play. And yes, maybe getting that insight will help people change. But one of the most liberating levers that you have about to bring about change in organizational systems is to see the circularity is to see the relational and to hold and see how you are playing a role in the system, which is co-creating, not with bad intent, often with good intent, often with the intent of being protective, um, et cetera. And the attribution is no longer bad. The attribution is now neutral. It is just to notice and see the pattern. And giving people that pair of glasses is a, uh, very liberating way of um, seeing. It opens up all kinds of possibility and releases all kinds of stuckness from organizational systems which are playing to their own constraint because of these circular relational dynamics between role. I could go on for hours, but maybe I'll stop there um, and say questions. Thank you so thing. much. Thank you so much, Joanne. Uh, look, a couple of questions popped up. I tried to uh, kind of put them in, uh, in, the, in the chat. So let me start from the top. Lee, would you like to, can you see my screen? Would you like to? Uh... No, no, sooner had I typed it than, than Joan had answered it. Ah, <laughs> so cool. Pretty much as soon as I hit the question mark, it was answered. I was like, thank you. Right. Daniel. And I think, Lee, it's yep. such an important distinction. And I think one of the um, distinctions that more and more we want to bring to organizations that the, the dynamic happens not in the relationship between two individuals, but in the relating and relational between. And in fact, I've got a slide that says relationship versus relatedness, relationship versus role relationship. 
And I think introducing this idea is really critical for us to, you know, bring this distinction. And Gregory Bates and leading systems thinker used to say, you know, difference is the difference that makes the difference. We think through distinction. And this is a very important distinction that we need to bring to organizations, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Daniel? Do these maps eliminate ambiguity prematurely? Um, no, in fact, what these maps allow people to do is learn to see that there isn't one truth and that allows them to bring in multiple perspective. And in fact, what people discover, like I discovered when I did my first map was how implicit it was to me, how I was assuming it was truth and how I hadn't tested my map with others. And it invited me into going and inviting in alternative maps and being able to look at them in relational terms, are they more similar or more different? And it actually opened up much more possibility than shut down. Um, and I think that's how they can be used. Yeah, I, I, I think it was just Sorry. wording that threw me a bit. That makes a lot of sense that by, by making assumptions explicit, we can, have, we can compare and discuss perspectives. Um, I guess I was anchoring a bit on the on the, on the role. So I, I often have people asking me, "Can you just tell me what my job is and my role?" And okay. and, and and I think it's just a, a just a different use of yeah. But, yeah. But I think Daniel, one of the things that I um, come up against all the time in organisations when I share this thinking is that oh, so you're talking about role clarity. So I've given them role clarity, Joan. I've told them what to do. We're not talking about role clarity in the technical sense of the task. We're talking about the roles that people occupy in relational terms. And so I've started shifting to talking about not role clarity, but role alignment and systemic role, not job role or task role, as in what people need to do. And I, I think, again, that's another very important distinction. Um, thanks, Daniel. Changing the role or the relationship as opposed to changing the person. Is that then not also changing the person? Yeah, I'm just interested in the interrelationship there between uh, if you're shifting role and relationship, do you have examples and then people actually go through uh, personal change themselves in that way? Yes, I think it invites uh, people into changing themselves, but you're not trying to change them in some linear way in order to get an outcome. But I do think doing the work and shifting role does change people. It can, definitely. Mm. They're connected. Just just go to someone else. <laughs> okay. okay. That's Ronald? Ronald? Could you give some examples of how you've implemented the all change using systems thinking? Um, so one example is, uh, I, I mean, I think, <laughs> I use it in multiple ways, either at an individual level to help individuals see their role in system. So one-to-one -one coaching. And um, I have a methodology which is called a coaching with the system in mind, which really begins with an individual drawing their map of the system and, and how they see their role in it. Um, and an example of that is a client who, um, she was a culture change expert. She was a consultant to a CEO of a rapidly growing um, uh, startup. And they had a very good relationship of trust. They worked really well together. And she was very successful in providing um, consulting and coaching services to him, as well as to his executive team. And as a result of that, they were growing so fast he invited her into the organization to be their head of culture. And she kind of considered it um, after a time, she decided that she had such a good personal relationship with the CEO, things were working so well. She worked so well with the executive team, she would go inside the organization and take up the role. And within about six weeks, she called me and said, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Um, I've done something to really upset the CEO. Our relationship is on, um, you know, heading for the skids. I, you know, I don't know what is, I'm going back to all my old, you know, issues with self and etc. I invited her to consider what was happening in terms of her role 
in relation to the CEO. And what became immediately visible through those questions to her was that the system had changed. Six weeks prior, she had been in a role where she was consultant and she had a client and she was on the boundary of the organization and the system. Now she was inside the boundary of the organization. And one of the things that I said is a description of system is a set of relations with the boundary. When you change boundary, you change system. And boundary maintenance is system maintenance. And one of the things that had shifted here is where she was positioned in relation to the boundary. And the other thing that had shifted was that her relational role to the CEO had now changed. She was no longer in role of consultant to a client. She was now employee to a manager and to a CEO. That context, that system, that role relation changes everything because the rules of engagement between a manager and a CEO are completely different between a consultant and a client. She had not changed her map. She was still taking up her role as if she were a client, uh, talking to a client, he had shifted his map because he was talking to an employee. And where those maps were no longer coherent was where the noise was. Because within six weeks, those two individuals had not changed who they were. But what had changed and what she had to see was she had to adapt and shift her role in relation to the role and the context uh, that he was, she was in and that he was taking up. And that equally applied to the role that she had been taking up as coach to the executive team who were now her peers. That context redefined the rules of engagement for how they were gonna be able to behave towards one another. And just asking some questions, helping her unlock that was um, an, you know, an example and I could give you hundreds of those individually. I think, um, and with it very rapidly, she could go back into the system, shift her role and things settle down. She didn't have to change who she was fundamentally. Um, at a whole system level, um, a, you know, a case study is a, a beer company, losing market share in a shrinking market, um, tried every technical solution and people solution, and yet the, that kind of trend and pattern was continuing. They invited me in and one of the things was um, that through the mapping, we were able to do a diagnostic of what was going on in the broader system. And what we discovered was two things. Well, we discovered lots of things, but two critical adaptive challenges or systemic things that they faced. One was that they had made an assumption that they were a, a consumer company and that what was gonna make them successful was going to market through their brands and through their products. And so their whole operating model was wired for the branding and marketing team to make the decisions and to set strategy. But what had shifted in the market was that in fact, more than 50% of their volume now was going through three large retail channels and the market system had changed. The customer had way more buying power in terms of how people purchased, what they purchased and how the brands were working in the market. But the leadership team had not adjusted their set of assumptions and not seen how they had to shift their role as a company in the market system and therefore also shift their operating model. And what we had to do was change the role of marketing and how it related to sales and how it related to the regional teams in terms of how they went to market, how they work together um, as an ecosystem. We did no restructuring, but what we did do was reframe their roles and reset their relational patterns and rules of engagement. And um, along with many interventions, which I don't have time to describe now, um, within, um, I think it was within three months, they met, they filled their budget hole. Within nine months, they were um, in organic growth for the first time in 17 years, and they were growing market share. Um, and they were ahead of budget. And there are a few examples, well, many of these kind of case studies, because if you can see the system shift the relational patterns of the ecosystem at a whole system level, um, you can bring about change very rapidly and get a very different result. Um, 
I'm aware we are at 5.30. Do you want to? Yeah, look, uh, we'll just stop here. We just have a couple of slides because I know some people will have to leave. Uh, we can just jump on a couple of things. We want to wrap up so people can leave. And Joanne, if you can stay, we can answer a bit more, a couple of more questions. Yeah. But uh, two things, guys. First, uh, please join our Slack channel. We can continue discussing there now. You can either scan this. Okay. Uh, we will also post these uh, this info on the uh, Meetup website. So you can either scan now or um, we can basically, you can just go to the URLs on the, uh, on the Meetup. The other thing is, um, before we leave, please, uh, can you do this survey? So please scan this now and uh, answer the questions in the survey. Quite important because we are trying to you know, maximize the value that we uh, that these meetups bring uh, to you. So this will help us tremendously to uh, gauge our uh, our understanding. So if you can scan it now, that'll be awesome. And we will we will put this um these links into the into the meetup as well as the Slack channel as well. And last but not least. Joanne has actually will give us uh, what she explained. We'll make it well. We call it as an early uh, Christmas gift from Joanne, but pretty much we'll post these. Uh, um, well, it's kind of handout. Let's call it like that, uh, and we'll post it on the Meetup and and the Slack channel as well, so you can pick it up from there. Okay. Um, I do like that photo. <laughs> yeah, because I think, you know, we give this handout to everyone. Everyone can have one. <laughs> so. If it were uh, in a room, we would say, uh, look and under your seats. <laughs> That's right. We're, we're going to do that trick. Look under your seats now. But it would have been a bit creepy. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so we had a couple of more questions, guys. Uh, let me just. I'm happy to stay. Just, uh, just conversation, if people. Yeah, yeah. Just Very good. One box it, um, Joan. Uh, how long do you feel like you could stay on to answer questions? I don't know, another fifteen minutes or so, if people want. Okay. Cool. Eric, excellent. Um, Thank you. I'm learning as well from the questions, so I love it. Yeah. Um, Joan, you had a uh, fantastic example before of what that mental map looks like in the relationships. Um, I just, and I know it's not about the drawing itself because for everyone that'll be specific to them, but what does that look like? I'm, I'm trying to get, sort of get a mental image of what that would look like and that might help me sort of figure out how you could structure those conversations. Yeah. Um, so probably um, I would say every single one looks different. Um, it, it's your own sort of fingerprint, <laughs> so to speak. Um, I think there are some patterns in the ones that I see. So some would be metaphorical. Uh, they tell a story like, you know, if it's a manufacturing client that have a drawing of the factory, they might have a truck, they might have themselves, a, you know, a few drawings of people and they'll start to kind of tell the story of their map in meta metaphorical terms. Um, and those are kind of beautiful visual um, manifestations of how they are seeing things in interconnection and in relationship. Some of those maps are just sort of circles um, with subsystems um, with arrows between them. And, you know, they show distinction through how they draw those circles, large ones, small ones, close in, not so close in. Um, some are concentric circles, you know, I, I think that, and some are, um, you know, just uh, in some respects, some people have used, uh, um, which I now have learned to kind of in the handout say, please don't use PowerPoint or tech because use a pen and draw it. You know, some people have done their maps as um, uh, Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> which is data in itself, right? Um, but I, I think that what I could do is send out a few examples of what those maps look like. But I think the most powerful way to discover that is just draw your own, you know, ha um, 
take as uh, if I had to say to you, think of a system that you're in and your role in it and draw how you're seeing yourself in that system and, you know, have a play with that. Mm. Thank you. But I'm happy to send out some examples of that as well. I think the key difference here, Eric, is that one of the things that I think has gone wrong with systems uh, intelligence in organizations is that it's been conflated with um, system dynamics. And, you know, Peter Senge's brilliant work with system dynamics and closed and open feedback loops. And when people talk about drawing a map of the system, often I think that's what people think, that you're going to draw a map of the closed and open feedback loops that are occurring in relation to a problem. What we're talking about here is mapping in a very, very different sense. It's the mental mapping and constructs that people hold in their minds of what is going on in the system rather than you know, those other kinds of system maps, which might be linear ones, which might be closed and open feedback ones. And so it's this more, what I would say, kind of second order cybernetic understanding of system mapping, which is making visible people's meaning making and construct of how they are defining the system and themselves in it. Can I just uh, jump in here? I know it's, um, it's um, we want to hear from you, but um, Michal, could you just uh, let me share something on a screen? I think um, one of the things that, that I was struggling previously was a lot of my learning about system thinking was hugely impacted by Senge work in system dynamic and and um, and and later um, Donald Lomedo. But I just want to share something with you. Uh, this map is from the book called Systems Thinker. This this book is taught in uh, Open University in UK. Um, both both the authors are you know well known systems thinkers, and and I think if you look at it, and again this is just one way of looking at it. You know you, you see all these different school of thoughts about systems thinking. And, and as you can see, system dynamic is just one of many, and even Peter Senge. And what I like about, um, what I like about um, Joan's um, approach is she has combined a lot of these ideas and synthesized a, a kind of a more practical way and, and, and uh, to, to use them in the context of organization. Like I, I'm, I'm hearing from you about Bateson, I'm hearing you about Senge, I'm hearing you you mentioning arduous, you know, double loop learning, a cough, a, lot, a whole lot others. And then also, I think what it was unique about your approach was bringing that, you know, also human aspect to system thinking, because I think, I think system thinking for a long time has been, you know, ironically dominated by really mechanical uh, way of looking at things. And, but I think I, I quite like that, that human aspect. So um, mm -hmm. I quite like you, the way you have synthesized all these various approaches into something useful and applicable. Mm. I'll just to stop and I, you know, I think the key thing about that is that you, as systems theorists and practitioners, we are able to look at the field and understand how it all interconnects, actually. Um, I think one of the issues, and you know, I have huge respect for Peter Senge's work and Dana Meadows and you know, and system dynamics. And so this isn't a, instead of, it's not a critique of that, but it's, it is an alternative and interconnected view of how you can look at organizations um, and bring systems thinking to organizations. I think one of the things that goes wrong with systems thinking today in organizations is that it doesn't look at organizations as a unique system and that organizations are different to family systems, are different to ecology, ecological systems. And what we've got to learn is what is absolutely unique, which is why I decided with the definition of what is an organization, because organizational systems need to be understood as quite unique and distinctive systems from others. And therefore the applications that we need to develop to help apply systems thinking in organizations needs to look different. I think one of the things that has happened is that we've taken ideas from family therapy and other um, systemic techniques which work brilliantly in family contexts, and we've tried to just transpose them <laughs> into organizational contexts. And in fact, you can't do that. 
Um, and I know, I don't know if Paul is still here, um, but one of the things um, that we talked about the other night in a conversation with Paul, who's a, um, an, another kind of systems practitioner and has been practicing for years, is that even like a methodology like constellations, which is being used a lot, often those constellations, which has come out of the family therapy and family systems movement and works really well there, people try and transpose without really understanding, well, how do you even work with constellations in organizational context quite differently? And I think that's one of the things that we need to really be focusing on is what is distinctive about organizational systems and how do we develop unique applications for those? Mm. Cool. Um, perhaps one more question. I'll just share my screen very quickly. Uh, Actually, maybe maybe instead of going to the screen, um, sure. Al, we should maybe ask the group if, if if somebody has a burning question as the last question, and ask it of yep. the group what they would like to ask. To ask. Sorry, Jonathan, unless it is Jonathan's one who calls it out. <laughs> okay. I do have a burning question, which I believe is just right next below the question list. So um, first of all, thank you very much, Joe. And uh, it's quite nice, We're really good to, to hear this, um, this uh, quite helpful. My question is quite simple. Um, it appears to me that it's quite important for us to understand um, whether or not we are have adopted the new pair of glass. So the question then is, how do you know that you have got the pair of glass? <laughs> Yeah, what a wonderful question. And um, someone asked me earlier today, how do you know you've got an adaptive and systems muscle, Joan? What will you see? And um, yeah, such a great question. Um, I think that one of the key things that you'll know is that you're no longer looking for attribution in the part and you are always if you're wearing the glasses you are thinking in terms of what's going on in the context what's going on in the in-between and in the relational so you're always looking at um, things in terms of circular co-creation and when you find yourself catching yourself saying well that part of the system is bad or wrong or that individual uh, is the problem, um, then you know you're in kind of lineal causal attribution to the part. If you say, oh, I can see how that behavior makes sense in relation to this behavior or this role makes sense in relation to this one, and you're able to see interconnection and interrelationship, then you're wearing the glasses. Um, and that might be too much of a theoretical description. Um, no, but no, I, I got it. That makes sense. One of the key distinctions. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of one thing before we, we ask the second question. Joan, I think you had a master class as well coming in. in um, okay. when, when is it? Is it in December or? 11, no, in February. I think. February. Did you want to just quick briefly talk about that? We will definitely put the link into Slack and the community as well. But if you want to just uh, briefly uh, before everyone drop off and then we can continue with questions for as long as we can stay. Yeah, I think what I'm going to focus on there is because I think at the moment transformation is such a huge topic, is how do we bring a systems lens to organizational transformation and I'm going to be sharing some of these case studies where I've helped organizations discover what are their second order systemic uh, challenges and help them address those with quite um, remarkable performance and culture results. So. You know, someone else earlier was saying, can you give some examples? I, I'm going to use that session to bring it to life more practically and some case studies and stories and how to do um, using the systems lens, but particularly in the context of transformation. Thank you. So we will, um, for the benefit of everyone, we will put the link in both Meetup and obviously um, Slack channel. Yeah, so you can cool. register for the master class. I think it's, it's not a long one as well. So about an hour and a half, right? Yeah, quite but I reasonable. think it will be more case study based. Um, so it can bring it to life for people quite practically. Whereas I think tonight I'm trying, and I'll give the frame again. Um, often people say, I've heard you say that one stone and you know, I can hear it 10 times. And every time I get a slightly different nuance because it's literally 
laying down a new neural pathway um, and making sense in such different ways. And the more you hear it, the more the neural pathway grows. Um, so I'll, I'll be sharing that again, but also making it a lot more practical. We'll have more time. It's interesting you say that I uh, listened to a podcast you were on, on um, transformational leadership. And I think I listened to it five or six times over before I sort of like started to get an inkling of what you were talking about as well. And I'm probably like a few people on the call, I'm probably going to listen to uh, this video about 20 times <laughs> as well. Um, I'm, I'm aware, Jonathan, you had a question and I think I, we cut you off. So if you'd like to ask that question, that'd be great. Whoops, no. sorry. Uh, I had a bit of an issue with the, the app. Um, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was just a, a bit of a question about how these these roles uh, relate, uh, might relate to um, to power structures and dynamics that, that exist outside the organization and, and that the organization comes out of, uh, that, that are even maybe part of the history of how the organization even came to be in the first place. Just because it's going along the lines of that idea that that you mentioned toward the beginning of the session actually of thinking about organizations not as groups of people with a common purpose but a little bit more of a maybe a realistic and, and rich richer way of of understanding what organizations are mm. so yeah, that, that's it mm. and i think it's an end i mean i think organizations are collections of people with a common purpose but i think if we just hold that assumption we have a blind spot and we're missing something else um so I guess I'm always kind of trying to live in the end with that rather than the either or. But um, could you give an example, Jonathan? What I'm just not sure how to come at answering your question because um, I think there's a few things in there. Um, yeah, it's a, a tricky question. I, I wouldn't expect that to be a simple answer, uh, especially in a, this time constraint. Like, but maybe one one way of getting at it is. Um, like, like companies go through different stages as as they grow for example if, if you look at a company and then a company will be one kind of organism at one stage of its development at another when it's it's a larger one and it's got shareholders and it's gone public then it's at a different stage and so it's a different kind of organism yeah. and so then the, how does that the the people who come together to form the company that there, there are dynamics there that there's there's ways that those people came came to form that company in the first place there were relationships that existed before that i realize this is kind of opening it wide up to a lot of a huge scope it's maybe beyond the scope of this but it, mm. I, I think that might play a role because then the the, the people people in who are in the organization are in there for some reason like they didn't just all get together and, and say we have a common purpose and therefore we'll all join this organization at the same time you know different people came at different times there was a whole history that, that behind it and that might affect how people see each other now in, in the organization oh, yeah. and then how people are hired and who gets hired and things like that. Yeah. I realize it's a big open question, so I don't, I don't, it might not have been the best question. <laughs> Maybe it's a bit too, too open. I think it's a great question. I mean, obviously, very complex question, but if you're asking, does the history of the company um, define where the company is at a moment in time? Absolutely. Um, so that company as an entity or the organization as an entity is defined by the context in which it's in. You know, the ex example I gave of the beer company, the context in the market had changed. It, it meant that they had to uh, shift. But I think if you look inside the system and historically um, the events that led up to and where that system is now, you, there is often very important data in what has come before um, and not in a way of um, looking for root cause historically like we're here because of what happened in the past but making sense of what's going on now in terms of the history of that system um, is very important lens to to bring in and you know one simple example of that or not so simple never simple is you know if you look at mergers and acquisitions very often when i come into an organization where there is a lot of um, cultural toxicity or underperformance or conflict between parts there has been a merger um, in that company or an acquisition that has not resolved itself 
and is still sitting in the system between the parts. And I, I could give very, you know, many examples of that, that, you know, a law firm I worked with where there were two practices that were in competition that were um, under one underperforming and one um, high performing, but they were in a fight between those two practices. That company had merged um, the law firms, two law firms had merged a long time ago. Um, and so they thought the merger 20 years later has was done and dusted, but actually the not joined up the merger hadn't happened in this part of the system. And where the 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 um, not joined up kind of where the merger didn't happen and the integration didn't happen was being held in the system between these two practices within the company. And when they discovered that that actually they were the two practices. The two merged companies were one was in Sydney and one was in Melbourne and the two practices were doing exactly the same in the market. One was Sydney based and one was Melbourne based, but they were missing that piece of data. And so it's very important often to understand what comes before in a system which might help us make sense of the current patterning and where some old patterning might remain. Yeah, I think we've gone uh, 20 minutes past <laughs> what we're supposed to. <laughs> Joanne, thank you very, very much. Uh, there'll be more on the Slack channel. So uh, if there is something, uh, yeah, post questions there, guys, and we'll see how we can answer them. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the community and to talk tonight. Very grateful. It was awesome. Thank you so much, Joanne. Thanks. And thank you all, guys. Thank you for staying a bit longer. So uh, I guess... Uh, See you next time.